Hi there. We're so glad that you're joining us tonight. This is election eve, in case you've been living under a rock for a while. And we <laughs> are with the results, and I am the executive director of the Museum of Broadcast Communication. And this program is part of a series of programs that we've been doing that coordinates with our curriculum that you can find on the website greatdebates.org. And it is about the influence of the broadcast industry, whether it's radio, television, or digital, and here we are tonight, digital, on the presidential race and particularly the presidential debates. But we uh, uh, we know that it doesn't stop after the debates stop, right? Uh, um, we know it keeps going. And so we thought that tonight would be a good night to take a breather um, on the back and forth of how to exactly teach this, because that's what we have been doing. How do we talk about this to children? How do we talk about this to students? And the Great Debate site has a curriculum there, eight modules um, that talk about everything from social media to late night to uh, um, Lincoln and Douglas, but let me go back to late night. That's one of the reasons why we have two guests here today who have just written a, um, a, a phenomenal, and I have read it cover to cover, book, The Sanity of Satire, Surviving Politics One Joke at a Time. And our guests tonight are two amazing gentlemen who have wonderful laughs. And so uh, we're hoping that we'll hear plenty of them tonight. <laughs> the first is Al Jeannie. Uh, I dream of Jeannie. Um, Al mm -hmm. is our friend and our fave. Um, uh, he's a retired professor of business ethics at the Quinlan School of Business, I got it all in, at Loyola University, Chicago. And he's also the co-founder and longtime associate editor of the business, business Ethics Quarterly and the Journal for the, of the Society of Business, which is the Journal for the Society of Business Ethics. I really get horrible when I'm reading things. So, um, and, and his cohort in crime is Abraham mm. Singer, who is a professor of business ethics and political theory in the Quinlan School of Business at Loyola University, Chicago. And the two of them have put their heads together to write this book on comedy, um, uh, which I think is really, it's real. It's a lovely book. And uh, it, there is a little bit of bait of sw and switch going on here. It does say surviving politics one joke at a time. And I yeah. do think we analyzing comedy a little bit more than we end up analyzing politics, which was totally fine with me. Um, but uh, um, tell me a little bit about how you two decided to actually do this because business ethics and comedy might not be uh, the, the connection I'd make, but I think you have a good uh, um, uh, argument for it, right? Well, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but the reason we did this book uh, together is because every time we saw each other after I was smart enough to hire him and we were smart enough to hire him, we said, hi, did you hear the one about? And we were telling each other <laughs> jokes all the time. I mean, 24 seven, no matter where we were, we were doing that. And then if Abe, if you remember, we were at a, a, one of our dreadfully interesting faculty meetings and it was over and I brought wine just to help us get through the evening. And I looked at you and I said, you know, I got a contract for a book and I'm too tired to do it, but you wanna do it with me? And he said, yeah. And we started writing. Am I right, Abe? That that's basically right. Yeah. I, um. You know, I I have a theory that that it's actually there's a chapter in the book on Jewish humor, um. And Al wanted cover, and so he was like, <laughs> <laughs> Abe has a really Jewish name. We could if I put his name on the book, we could get away with it. Um. No, no. That that that's ex that's exactly right. Al Al had written this other book. Um on the importance of being funny, which is sort of a more general meditation and uh, celebration of the role of comedy just in everyday life. And we thought, you know, with that, with that sort of background and expertise, um, and with my training and background in political science and political theory, we could maybe do something kind of fun and funny. But yeah, it really came mostly from us just always joking around. Yeah. Well, uh, I love the way, I love the pace of the book. I love the intensity in the beginning. I did have a feeling, oh my gosh, this is not going to all be about Donald Trump. But um, mm -hmm. uh, um, it, is a, it is certainly, just for those of you out there, we are a um, 501c3. So we are apolitical. And this is a nonpartisan book um, uh, um, about humor. Right. Um, so just want to be clear on that. But right. um, the, I mean the book starts with a quote that says, up until now, comedy didn't usually write itself. It was a hard job. Not anymore, thanks to you know who. You're quoting Lewis Black there. Right. And, and we went out of our way to avoid political 
traps here. We wanted to talk about Donald Trump, love him or hate him, is now absolutely a catalyst for satirical commentary and has, has engendered a whole series of comics that I didn't even know existed right now. The new one last night on Netflix, I'm sure Abe follows, he's, he's younger, he's able to stay up later to watch Saturday Night Live. I haven't seen Saturday Night Live in 10 years, but nevertheless, not in real time. Uh, this new woman who's now mimicking Trump. But the reality oh. is Trump is a joke catcher, you know, and he's there. And think about, think about, he, that's not Donald Trump. Uh, I, by the way, by that. the way, we have a special guest tonight. That is Ms. Minerva. That's right. And so if you yeah. hear her, um, she we, it, we don't think it's political commentary, but we will <laughs> welcome them in all comments. <laughs> and I want to turn it to Abe now, but I think if you look at the uh, uh, TV at 1030 at night, again, something I only see after I tape it in the morning, um, it, it's a, three shows are about Trump. Three shows are political shows. And one show is completely dedicated to taking him apart, two shows, to completely dedicated to taking him apart. The other shows bring in other things. And so, as Lewis Black said, it, he, it was tongue in cheek and he was being way over the top. And then he went on to critique Trump from a comic point of view. And I think this is what satire is. Humor is telling a joke to make you laugh, to take the edge off life. Satire is kind of militant sarcasm to make another point. That is that. Yeah. I, I, just one thing about that, though, is um, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with being partisan or political. And, and I, I also don't think Al or I necessarily hide our beliefs in the book. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think you would read the opening chapter and, and be confused as to whether or not we, we like Trump. Um, <laughs> but, but I think the point is that to reduce thinking about satire or the importance of political comedy uh, just to sort of the orders of the day, which is like Trump bashing, right? Or just talking, you know, it, it is, is to do a disservice to comedy and political humor generally. So we wanted to yeah. not fall into the trap of the present and kind of think more generally and broadly about uh, satire and its importance for us. So I, I do have a question, you know, that we are live on Facebook here. And so we, uh, we want to make sure that we are giving instant gratification to those on social media because it's crucial. Um, and one of the questions that we have is, I personally find it annoying when people say Donald Trump is good for comedy. What do you think? Well, Abe, you want to take that first and then I'll come at you? Yeah, you know, I, I, I love the question because I, I'm one of these people who I, I actually got one of those... Um, uh reminders you know on facebook where it says what you posted like five years ago or something like that and apparently right before the election i said oh well donald trump would at least be great for humor so i, I was one of these people who thought exactly what this person uh is is rallying against that i've come to agree with with the the question uh or the person who posed the question which is i think at this point it's yeah, it hasn't been good for comedy at the end of the day, or or it's been at least a mixed blessing. I think it's given a lot of people a lot of fodder, but then sometimes it's become sort of formulaic at points, or it it can be in danger sometimes of uh, lulling us <laughs> yeah. into sort of a you know into just a complacency. Right, well, I see it as a joke. It's also very polarizing. I mean, what you were talking yeah. about, Al, is late night hosts, and you have Jimmy Fallon, you have Jimmy Kimmel, you have Stephen Colbert. They're all at the same time. And um, uh, you know, my husband and I will will scroll through, we'll do the monologues at night, and uh, um, uh, and and there are instances where, because of what happened, you know, it leads to a natural joke, and so you will see the same joke on three yeah. in three of the oh, absolutely. absolutely. And um, and so it's. To me, it's a. Um, I get I get a little annoyed with it, and and so I take a break. With uh, um, uh, Jimmy Fallon is is probably less political. Um, right. Uh, it just it, it it's 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 almost too much. And there is a part, an old school part of me, um, uh, that my parents raised me to believe that you know. Um, and I and again, I know that this is a time like no other. That the office of the president, um, uh, you know, there has to be some honor and respect for it. And so it wears thin on me, even though I I, I understand exactly where it's coming from. So yeah, is it too much? It is too much. I, I would ask you. Uh, I argue that Trevor Noah has taken a wonderful show, um, The Daily Show, and made it simply. Um, a, a graduate school uh, analysis of Trump of the day with a few laughs in there. 
Now, I don't necessarily disagree, but I think if Trump is bad for comedy, it's been, there's so much of it there. And, and we've only gone to that and we haven't looked for other things. But remember, satire isn't just comedy. Satire is with a purpose. Satirists want to make a point. A joke is Henny Youngman saying, a secret to happy marriage, simple, simple, a dinner and dancing two days a week. I go on Tuesday, she goes on Thursday. Boom, da, da, boom, boom. And then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. Political satire is an attempt to move the bar somewhere along the line. But frankly, I'm sick of hearing about him just as a news and gesture of news. And I'm sure Abe is too. Abe is the political theorist. I'm just the guy who's read a lot of books. But after a while, politics can kill itself by dwelling only on itself. Well, and it, and it becomes a, something when you talk about this with people who, uh, um, with people who don't agree with the bashing in any way, shape, or form, you, um, uh, um, it, it again, the polarization of it is um, the it, it is the Hollywood liberals who are who are who are pulling this out, and we are against them, et cetera, et cetera. Abe, um, are, are do you where are you on all this? So. I mean, my main worry with Trump, just to get back to the question, you know, is Trump good for comedy and, you know, being tired of hearing that. Uh, so my worry is less about The Office. I think, um, frankly, I think the honor of The Office has been denigrated without the help of comedians um, <laughs> currently. Um, but it, it, so so to me, that's not, I, 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 you know, that that doesn't really bother me as much. Uh, I, I do think it hasn't been good for comedy just in terms of originality or cleverness, right? So I think in some ways right. it's been good for comedians. Like it's, you know, it's easy to write the joke, but I think like the craft, the originality, the surprise, the shock, all these things that I really love about comedy have maybe been depleted because you kind of have to make fun of what you have to make fun of on any given day. Uh, right. my daughter agrees. I would quote, I would quote Dave Chappelle, which is, which is Minerva's yeah. favorite comic. She was just yay yeah, into that. Dave Chappelle, in a recent interview with uh, uh, with Letterman, just absolutely brilliant in his little town in uh, Ohio, um, talked about that. It talked about that he's he's a comic, he's a satirist of uh, of politics, but you can't just dwell on that. And he's much more elliptical than these bang over the head commentaries. And again, I would suggest that Trevor Noah is moving away from comedy and just is becoming a smart ass political commentator that offers a couple of comic edges along the way because he's on every night. Not... So I'm, I'm just going to push. No, no, no. I'm going to push back on that because I actually think Trevor Noah was in that mode um, and he does do a lot of Trump stuff, but he also, I, I think, has broadened in that I am more likely to hear about global politics on Trevor Noah's uh, show more likely than I am on any of the other nightly shows. And so uh, I, I'm very impressed with the depth that he goes into. He does hit on politics, but he also gives us this, I'm from another country view. Um, and, yes. and, and I actually care about the rest of the world and why right. shouldn't you be, you know, cause if you didn't know, now, you know, segment is usually about something else going on in the world. So I agree um, with you, but I think, I think though, if you put together all the minutes that he does, it's, mo it's, it is the majority on Trump, but you're right. I've seen him perform in South Africa and America and on TV now over the years. He was just damn funny without bringing up political jokes and just talking about being a South African and what that means coming to America, right? The immigrant experience. But I think what I, I'm talking about here is that um, political satire, you want to ch change the agenda a little bit, but I am reflecting what Ava suggested, but we're beating him to death and bad humor has a negative effect rather than, than a good effect. And I'm wondering if we're being saturated with these jokes. And for example, Saturday Night Live has from day one satirized the president. Every single uh, president has had one of those cast members make fun of him and imitate him and make fun of him, so on and so forth. And now Baldwin has gotten an Emmy for it, right? But I'm tired right. of seeing Baldwin do that. It's it's old hat at this point. And I'm wondering, I, I think Abe sort of agrees with that. And and there's a danger to comedy. We're both worried about satire and, and its political ramifications. We're also wondering about, is it funny? So what could you get, um, Abe, can you give us, um, uh, you know, a real schooling on, again, that difference between comedy and satire? Uh, I, I mean, so, 
the way Al likes to put it, and it's a way that I, I like, is um, that it's comedy with a sort of militant edge uh, aimed at power, right? And that's that's really, to me, what I think is important about it, right? Is that fundamentally it's comedy aimed at power. Uh, I think a lot of times when people hear satire, they sort of think of sarcasm or irony. So they think of Jonathan Swift or something like that. Um, and obviously that's an important tradition of satire, but I think the way I understand satire or what I think is important about satire is that it's comedy with its sights trained on and aware of uh, the nature of power in society, wherever that power so I, lies. I want right. to, I want to, I want to quote from you all. So let's start out with some basics. One humor from pie in the face slapstick to sophisticated cerebral satire seems to be a universal feature of the human condition. Two, there is no platonic ideal of the perfect joke or the perfect joke formula. Three, different folks like different jokes. I love that line. Four, when you have to diagram a joke, show how it works and explain why it's funny, then the joke ceases to be funny. Five, comedy is a rough game, risking offense is part of that game. And six, Satire is a specific species of joke telling. It intentionally uses humor to draw attention to actions, issues, and ideas that need modification or correction. So, um, uh, um, I, 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 I loved that the the. I mean, it looks like I only read the first page of the book, right? But no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna give you. You're so far. You got a C plus. You're doing really well here so far. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna power up there. You know, and, you're um, in trouble when you're. Sorry, you know you're in trouble when you're in an NPR interview, and Abe has had this happen too, where you get in front of the person, and and this is when we actually could see each other face to face. Remember those days when more than three people were in a room? Fabulous! I could hardly wait for them to come back. Um, but then the, they would look at the mic would go on your live air. Well, uh, Mr. Genie, and why did you decide to read uh, write the book that you just finished, the name of which is, and then they read it off the copy in front of you? You know you're in trouble. So you've passed that test so far. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I, I actually, you know, um, uh, what I love about this, we are talking about the politics of it, and and I do want to switch that up because the book is much more than that. It really goes into, uh, um, uh, um, you know, as I'm looking, it, it, it's going into. I, I do love the uh, um, whole chapter on uh, why are Jews so funny. Um, uh, um, I will say though that that is the longest chapter in the book, and I want to have a bone to pick with you. So, um, the fairer and funnier <laughs> stuff is the shortest chapter in the book, other than the last chapter, um, and. And um uh, and and as we build up and we talk about um, satire that doesn't come until like uh, um, chapter four as you're building up um, past Trump and you go into talking about satire and satirical animals and stuff and who are some of the 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 gods of this we you weave in all of these people from different backgrounds but you it's interesting you until you get to the fairer sex you barely only mention um, one woman Joan Rivers so are, are women not I know that you address this in one chapter. But in your sense of satire, are women not um, uh, uh, a, uh, a satirical animal? You want to say handle that first, Abe? I've... Yeah. So, so the, the, I mean, the first thing to note is the is the editorial pro. So, the, I believe there was more in the original cop, the original book that got chopped out. So there was more stuff on Ali Wong and some some more recent comics. Uh, so, so. Really briefly, of course, women are satirical animals. Some of my favorite comedians right now, you know, so so in terms of like Trump jokes, um, uh, Wanda Sykes Hall, I thought had the best one <laughs> over the past few years, uh, which we can uh, get into it a little bit. It was about the toilet paper on the shoe. I thought I thought it was brilliant. Uh, so that's obviously obviously women are just as satirical, just as important to comedy and satire as men are. Um, I would say there's a fair bit of history in the book. So a lot of the book covers historical sources and, you know, comedy has comedy and show business generally have been deeply sexist and misogynistic, um, yeah. industries. So, so some right. of that just reflects the sort of sad fact of that, but you know, that, that, that doesn't let us off the hook entirely. Um, you know, that, that we're just they're right. not mentioned until that chapter is obviously regrettable, but yeah. Okay. Alan, okay. I, I, I you think it's regrettable or uh, go ahead, Jill. Sorry. sorry. No, no. So go ahead. I, 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 I was trying to chastise, yeah. and um, uh, um, and that, and no, and I've no, you're just you're whining at us. You're complaining. This is what happened. Right. No, seriously. In, in the other book, in the earlier book, uh, 
we talk, I talked about uh, uh, jesters, and sadly, there were, there were that, that we know of, there were no male jesters, and the two female jesters dressed as males and were found out later in life. The reality is that if you look back uh, on the history of comedy in America, there have been women comics up and down the line. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we try to focus on three there, sort of Sarah Silverman, and, and, even, and even picking out the, the one that we wouldn't expect, the, the blonde goddess um, that um, was doing satire, satire on being a woman, satire on, on, on you know, Joan Rivers on being uh, uh, what she was. Uh, women certainly have now, and in, in, in Abe's age group are major players. In my age group, there were two or three. But in Abe's right. age group, and I think Sarah Silverman is between us. You agree, Abe? But certainly, she was always, always a satirist. She didn't tell jokes. She made commentaries, just like Mort Saul, only with more sex in it. So, so there, some of the. Go ahead. Uh, go so, ahead sorry. Um, so there was also, a, <laughs> this is just to show how nerdy, in terms of the editorial process, originally there was like three or four pages on Afra Ben, who is like an 18th century English playwright who I love, who was like this incredible satirist and who was talking about really dirty stuff back then. Um, but uh, we, for some reason, Al thought that talking about like an 18th century playwright might not be the most interesting thing to readers. Um, so I got, <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, um, but yeah, I, I but, knew him, but and, I didn't like him, that's why. Right. So, so, so we will, we will, we'll put aside the, 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 the woman thing here, and, but, and let's go back to some of the, the pillars of satire. So um, um, who, who are some of the greats that really started it? And as you say, they are men. So um, uh, um, it, we've got, we've got, we start with Twain. No, we start with who? Who, who do we start with? Go ahead, Ian. Um yeah, I, I mean, right. So, so first, the thing to note is like here we're talking about American satire specifically, right? Obviously, satire goes much, much further back. Um, but yeah, so I guess you could say Twain. Though, though, I guess there's a certain degree to which you know Hancock's barb about writing his name pretty big on the Declaration of Independence had a certain satirical edge to it. Um, but yeah, I would say you know Twain is the great originator of of American satire. Uh, you know, I don't I don't think that would be terribly provocative of, of a statement. And, and perhaps the first stand-up satirist who then to earn money after his printing business yeah. failed, um, uh, went around the country uh, and his wife was sick, so on and so forth, uh, went around the country and bad, and, and bad investments in the, at the end of the grand uh, administration, went around the country doing stand-up. He didn't think of it as stand-up, he was making commentary. And then Will Rogers comes along who becomes this, this, this philosopher, this cowboy philosopher who says, uh, I don't write anything, I just read the papers every day. And, and the president offers, uh, asks him in, and people listen to him. He was, he had two radio shows a week, was it one or two, I forgot, Nate. He had a column in the New York Times. He was the second most popular t uh, movie star at the time. Shirley Temple was one, uh, and people listened to him. He became the voice of the common worker. And it was a fantastic experience. But the, the, the transition for us, the beginning of it all, and I'd like Abe to talk about it, um, is Mort Saul, who then changes the face of comedy in America. Not right away, and not absolutely, but certainly did. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're actually more of the person to talk about Mort Saul, <laughs> Al, uh, um, just because you know, I, I know because I've had. You definitely wrote that section. You know, I think you knew him, right? Didn't you babysit for him? No, 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 back no, in the no, day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did have a if I recall correctly. Yeah. yeah, you did. You did. You know, that's why I quit. This kind of smart language from the younger faculty. <laughs> I couldn't put up with it anymore. I decided I want my own dignity left here. So talk about <laughs> satire speaking to power. That little guy is doing it right now. Anyway. <laughs> no, I did. I, I met Saul a couple of times because he, he stood on stage. He finished his set. And people walked up to him and talked to him. So I did at the Gate of Horn. You, you know, neither one of you remember the Gate of Horn in Chicago, but it really was this locus of people. And the rest were comics, even the Second City people. They were doing satirical vignettes, but they weren't doing stand up comedy. And Abe will talk about this much better than I do. The, the stand up comic is America's gift to comedy. It doesn't exist until Americans begin to do it. Uh, and the ones we like now are the ones who have more to say than the Henny Youngman and the Milton Burles of the world. My favorite Milton Burl joke is so painful. 
uh, although Jerry Seinfeld comes close to it, is the husband looks at the wife and says, do you think our marriage has run its course? Have we burned ourselves out? Are you missing, or is something missing here? And she looks at him and says, wait till the commercial that we'll talk about. Um, and that was supposedly funny. <laughs> You know, that's supposed to be funny. Now, I just read all the whole Jerry Seinfeld book, uh, Abe, and I'll give it to you, pass it on. Um, but you got to hear his voice in the background to hear it. He talks about nothing, but he's really a satirist uh, of, the, the, of the domestic life, and he's brilliant at that. Uh, but I like to know whose Abe favorite ones are, because when Abe names a comic, I got I to gotta run to Google right away and find it. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I guess it's quite currently or historically. So, you know, um, if we're talking in the 20th century, obviously Lenny Bruce and George Carlin and Richard Pryor yes. are extremely important. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But for me, in terms of my own lifetime and the people who uh, who are important to me um, and and are Dave Chappelle and John Stewart uh, for the right. 21st century, uh, those are the guys. And then currently, I actually think the best satirists on air right now are Jesus and Mero. Uh, who really? have a very different angle than ever? Yeah, yeah. I think the, the, they're the ones who, when they make fun of Trump or or anybody else in politics, I always find it the most funny because their their approach to politics is like their approach to everything else, where they just sort of act. They respond to videos and they respond to what people say as if they're like, you know, everyday people acting crazy on the subway. Yeah. So it's yeah, just, yeah. It, you know, it, which is just sort of an approach to Trump that nobody else has. And they just do it so well. And it's always funny. So both on their on their show and on their podcast, it's fantastic. And this is so this is have, interesting. The we have a question. We have a question. Um, is somebody's asking, has the satirical work directed at Trump really differed much from other presidents? Do you think it's is it more than or is it? I mean, I know that that um, uh, um, I know that there has been vicious stuff directed it all the way back to you know way back and if you go to the lincoln museum the stuff that you hear about uh, um uh, in that in that one hall where the uh, yeah. um, editorials are and letters are read um it's just vitriolic but um but what what what, what is it different okay i'll go first Abe. i i think you're right uh, you have to remember that lincoln was called a long arm ape in the press he was depicted in the press and the Chicago Times at the time, I think it was called the Chicago Times uh, at the time, um, uh, as a gorilla with a face on it. So the, the satire there was vicious and deep and horrible. You don't even want to know about the South, what, what they said of him. Uh, but all presidents have been, you know, there's been satire connected to it. Uh, they're often very mild, you know, uh, Grover Cleveland, ma, ma, where's your pa, going to the White House, ha, 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 because he, supposedly spawned an illegitimate child. And even though he's denied um, parental origins, he did, uh, he did take care of the child and the woman uh, after that point. All presidents have made fun of Wilson for stuttering uh, because uh, of the stroke afterwards, rather cruel kind of thing. We made fun of Jimmy, Jimmy what? Jimmy, Jimmy, he always called himself Jimmy. I remember the Saturday night, he said, Jimmy, he's the president, he calls himself Jimmy? You know, what, what, what's, what kind of name is that? And her, uh, somebody as, as mild as Herbert, not Herbert, uh, Warren G. Harding, that famous joke where a woman, a woman runs up to him at a meeting and says, Mr. President, I've bet $1,000 I can get you to say four consecutive words. And he looks at her and he says, you lose, madam. Um, these are not just jokes, they've been satirical comments. And certainly we made fun of Bill and uh, Mr. Bush too, Mm -hmm. I don't know, Abe, do you remember as a political scientist, did we just dislike him and didn't make fun of him as much because so much was going on or we didn't think he was smart enough? I don't remember heavy jokes about Bush too. Do you, Abe? Oh, yeah, oh. we made fun of him tons, him and Cheney. Yeah, there was a Comedy Central show, That's My Bush. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, it's, oh. so, so, and yeah, so there's definitely, I mean, Jon Stewart rose to prominence criticizing right, right, uh, right. that administration and the media. Uh, machine behind it. Um, I think so. So certainly presidents have been skewered and lampooned since they're, you know, since George Washington, right? Maybe not including George Washington, but everybody at since, right? Um, but I think the big difference now in terms, you know, so is there a qualitative shift? A, I think people are a bit more brazen and about it. Yeah. So there's, and, and again, that's not entirely new. Um, but there's sort of just, uh, I am right to make fun of this person. I'm going to make fun of this person with, with very little scruples about it. But I actually think the biggest thing that makes 
this very different is um, is just the access to comedy through the internet and through digital media. Yeah. So yeah. this obviously starts under Obama, but there wasn't the same type of satirical scrutiny at Obama. But it's on YouTube, it's on Twitter, it's on all yeah. of these things. Yeah. And so I think that actually is in some ways the big difference. That's why we're so saturated with it because it's literally everywhere. Yeah, so I, I think I, for I, my I children. I do want to add something in there because I do think that when you look at, again, when you look at what was going on, what I mentioned with Abraham Lincoln, um, and then you look at what went on under Obama, uh, I mean, in that administration, there was, a, again, a, a, a racist, um, it wasn't just an undertone, it was an overtone, um, and it was, uh, um, it was really vicious. I think we forget that. Um, and I don't know, I, I wonder, is it as vicious now with Trump, um, um, is it a? Uh, um, it does, or 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 did we did we turn a corner or what? Well, I think, well, we I think with Obama. I, sure. Sorry, ahead, yeah. Sure. I, what I was just gonna say with Obama, I think obviously there is horribly critical and nasty and deeply deeply racist and screwed up things said about him. Um, they weren't by and large said by comedians, or certainly not like. Yeah the main professional comedians, you know, the, there wasn't from the late night the same way, like, you know, they would take their shots occasionally, but he wasn't in their eye. So, or in their, in their sights, the way Trump is, or the way other presidents have been, the way Bill Clinton was even, right? So it's not mm -hmm. really partisan in that regard. Um, so, so I, I, I think certainly Trump isn't the first president to be criticized, <laughs> um, but I think the level of comic interest, and again, our access to that comic um, scrutiny is just is high. Right. So is comedy. Obama. Uh, go so ahead. Go, please, Al, Go ahead. I was going to say, don't forget, Obama preempted a lot of this by embracing comics, by going on comedy shows, um, even on the Fern show with uh, you know, and, and he asked, "How is it to be the only the last black president?" And his response is, "How is it to be this is the last show you'll ever do?" Uh, he he played with comedy. His last time at the press conference, he brought down the house. Now he had comic writers. He even hired the guy. He was just to be a comic writer. So in some sense, he fought back. But I want to go back to Abe, Abe's sage-like analysis. This new media that we have. For me, the major outlet for satire over the last forty-five years has been Saturday Night Live. It's been the you know the big Kahuna. That's where it comes from. But now it's everywhere uh, and, and 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 pervasive. And that there are no barriers anymore. One of the reasons for Lenny Bruce's lack of popularity was he was too dirty too soon. Um, now, Lenny Bruce would just be, an, Abe, am I right on this? Lenny Bruce would be just another comic in some sense. Um, no, no, no more vicious than anybody else along the line. But he was outrageous so soon that I think that turned a lot of people off and prohibited him. And it also was against the law at that time, or let's not get into that. But he never had that kind of mass following. I think he's had a greater following in death than in life. Abe? So, so let me ask you though. When it, it, it does, when you look at the late night um, uh, jokes, when you look at a lot of it, is it um, are political jokes predominantly the area for Democrats? Because we have uh, more liberal leaning. <laughs> or where are where are our Republican um, uh, comedians who are skewering the left? Uh, Fox, every time they come on the air. Isn't that a comedy show? I mean, isn't, isn't that comedy? I, I thought it was comedy. I, I, I didn't know, did I miss something here? I don't know any uh, card carrying uh, uh, Republicans up there saying, let me, you know, uh, make fun of the Democrats. I haven't heard that. But who's the biggest persona out there right now? Comics don't take pot shots at kids because kids don't have a universal, tra you know, there's no universal translation and that seems cruel. Comics take pot shots at big people that everybody understands so that you have something to say. So, so well, let's mean, go back. Go ahead, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. No, it, well, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, so I think if you talk to conservative comedians or people who are conservative who like comedy, they would say you, the reason why we don't hear from conservative comedians is because the media, the professional outlets are skewed liberal and so they don't get a shot. Um, there right. might be some truth to that, for all I know. I don't know. They're, you know, or it's just that they're not as funny, uh, <laughs> which which is you know me being snarky. Um, but and I'm sure. I, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. And and to be clear, it's not just conservative comedians who not, might not get a platform. It's also people who are to the left of Democrats who are often mm -hmm. not given 
uh, platform right. or who aren't given, you know, the the sort of outlet that, you know, more mainstream political comedians are. And it still has to be funny. That you got to deliver a point. It's got to be a, 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 a boom, and there's a laugh point. If it doesn't, satire loses its purpose and loses its edge and message. So, so let's go back to um, another part of the book that I found fascinating. Well, I, one, I I loved the. Um, there were so many different nuances in there of things that I didn't know. Uh, um, uh, I didn't know, for example, and I thought I knew a lot about Joan Rivers that she was at um, uh, um, that she was at Second City. I didn't realize that. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I and I also did not know. I love the part about um, Dave Chappelle's two biggest influences. Mm. It, I thought That's that was Abe's God. Abe, Abe could speak to that. Yeah, Chappelle is. And yeah, now yeah. So my, because of Abe, <laughs> no, because of Abe, the, I not like him. That so that uh, the first time I heard him talk about so his two influences. So the one is very obvious, which is Richard Pryor. Um, but the second is something I, I first heard him talk about on Inside the Actor's Studio years and years ago is Bugs Bunny. That <laughs> he says Bugs Bunny is one of his biggest influences. And it's the type of thing that sounds and then you think about it and it's quite obvious, right? His facial expressions, his cadence, the way he delivers jokes, his knowing smile, his no, you know, that that thing he does. Um, they're all very influenced by Bugs Bunny and uh the um now I'm blanking on the vocal artist who did Bugs. Um, Mel Blank. Oh, um, oh Mel, Blank. Mel Blank. Thank you. Yeah, Mel Blank. Yeah. Wow. So, um, yeah, which, which is great. And and you know, Bugs is is satirical too, right? Bugs is always taking on the powerful on behalf of us, which he, yeah, he yeah. lets us in yeah. on when he gives us the wink, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he yeah. took on up. What the hell? Um, uh, <laughs> and you you mentioned Joan Rivers. Let me come back to that real quickly. Joan Rivers and and um um. Yeah, I'm blanking on uh, I'm blanking on the other gentleman right now. Excuse me. Come on, Abe. Uh, he's dead now. George Carlin. They both started off as straight on comics, you know, uh, right. and they both did straight on. They uh, George showed up in a tuxedo. Uh, it wasn't until he got to uh, the Smothers Brothers show that he began to change, and then he dropped it all. I mean, he had this metamorphosis, which was propelled by drugs and alcohol, but you know, it nevertheless had this metamorphosis. And Joan Rivers just told funny, cute. Jewish girl jokes, right? My mother was so desperate. I wasn't married by 25 that she had signs in the front lawn, last a girl before the expressway, you know, and she did these silly things. But then she became a commentator on women and women's roles and the role of women in, in, in American life. And even the Jewish American princess, you know, she took those on. And George mm -hmm. took on everything from language to commentaries by popes, et cetera, et cetera. And, and like Letty Bruce, after a while watching George Carlin, you had to read the papers for a month. Otherwise, you didn't get what he was talking about. Oh, they both had an anger to them that was just uh, um, viciously funny and, uh, uh, um, and, and very much in social commentary uh, as opposed to just the quick joke, the quick laugh. But um, you have said here that we are inundated with all of this during this administration mm -hmm. and during this time. Is it, um, uh, um, have we gone to the point where we've jumped the shark? Have we gone too far? Have we, have these comedians gone too far? We have, mm -hmm. you have mentioned as well about Michelle Wolf's uh, um, uh, um, stint in front of the White House Correspondents' Dinner, where she just got pillared, which I thought was just ridiculous. Uh, Stephen Colbert got pillared there. We got, we, you know, this is supposed to be satire. This is supposed to be, but they all were, um, uh, um, were were again pillared by the White House correspondents for going too far. Is there such a thing as too far in comedy? Uh, so this is this is a place where we, yeah, this is a place where we disagree uh, slightly. Um, so you know, with with the correspondence dinner. So I thought Michelle Wolf's uh, correspondence dinner speech was amazing, right? It was just like incredible. Uh, and in some ways, you know, getting pilloried by the press, by the, by, you know, by the correspondence of the White House, maybe isn't the biggest uh, shame in a comedian, right? Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that means you are doing something correct. Um, so I tend to be uh, kind of maximalist about these things. I tend to think that we should be giving comedians and artists generally as much space as possible to do their thing. That doesn't mean they can't ever cross lines, but I tend to think like, 
uh, satire is important, comedy is important, and if we want these things to be good, we have to understand that they're going to be risky, and they're going to involve yeah. taking risks. And sometimes that means crossing a line, and it's our, you know, if we care about comedy and satire, that means sometimes accepting that what comedians and satirists are doing is pushing buttons, pushing the envelope, and maybe making us uncomfortable, and maybe that's the point. Al, yeah, now, let me just ask the question to you in a different way because we had somebody ask this and so I want to get their question here and I think it fits your um, uh, um, you, what you were writing. Do you think there are any political issues that are off limits? Does it depend on the comedian and their relationship to the issue? Yes, there are things that are off limits and yes, there are things even off limits you could talk about depends on the comedian and the relationship to it. You know, one of the things for me is I think Abe and I really agree more than disagree. I think there are always limits. I think when jokes approach hate crime, hate, um, hatred, then I think that's inappropriate, um, uh, that it's gone too far. You know, there are jokes that are just make me wince. I've never told an AIDS joke. I've never told a Biafra joke. Um, I've never told a, a 911 joke either. And, mm -hmm. and as Abe will testify, I tell jokes about everything except my wife who beats me senseless if I do anything wrong. Um, that was supposed to be a joke, obviously it died, but nevertheless, we'll leave it alone. Um, I do think there are limits. I do think there's something called, you are still a social performer and a social milieu. How far do you want to go? And, and, and some, so you can tell the joke too soon. You really can't tell it too soon is still too soon. And there is, timing is important. You're talking about the audience, you're talking about timing. I do think, God, I don't want to talk about children rape jokes or something and there's nothing funny about that or even if you're trying to get to the point of ch child abuse in regard to sexual slavery i i could never do that but i think abe has a larger point depends how you deliver it again it's delivery 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 huh right. um maybe we need artists to be the warning canaries in the mind so it's delivery yeah and it's, also, it's also timing sorry well timing of, yeah. um on the on the whole issue you both diverge you begin to start writing about this when you're talking about louis ck yeah right mm -hmm. and Ed, yeah i mean i mean say? no so my view and this maybe ties into to louis ck um so yeah my view is any topic is potentially fair game um it just has to be done well and done funny uh and there's some jokes yeah. where that's hard to do and so then there's some topics where it's hard to make it funny and so you shouldn't tell a joke about it because it won't be funny and that's your job um but i but i am made anxious by the idea of drawing lines and saying like no this can't be uttered this can't be said this can't be touched this yeah. can't be played with because i think the whole point of and power of satire is precisely that you play with ideas that are taboo and that make people uncomfortable so obviously you know so well, al said you know hatred isn't funny and obviously i agree but then the question is well what constitutes hatred what constitutes something that's so offensive these have to be subject to debate and reflection and part of what satire yeah. does is can get us prod us to reflect on these yeah. things and wonder whether you know like there was a time where making homosexual jokes jokes about not right. not making fun of homosexuals but making jokes that involved homosexuality were considered beyond the pale and like Comedians were right to push those envelopes, right? Comedians were right to, to say the hell with that. We're going to make these jokes, even if this offends people, um, you know, precisely because that's what comedians ought to do. Now, so so Louis C.K., um, we, we talk about, so uh, after his famous fall from grace, he was doing all of these um, small club shows where he was working out jokes and a tape leaked of him doing this joke about the Parkland shooting. Right. Um, and about the people, the the, pro, the activists who came out of that. And he's like very dismissive of them. And, and there was a New York Times piece about him. People yeah. really uh, he, people lost even more. You know, it wasn't clear that he, people could lose esteem in him anymore. And then they lost more. Um, but I think what's important there is the big problem with that joke was that it wasn't good or funny. Yes, uh, I, I think it's possible yeah. to tell a joke about I, I you know I, I do and i think if you look at the context that he was trying to draw on he wasn't actually trying to make fun of them i think he was trying to do something right. a bit different it just wasn't well delivered or well crafted so it was a bad right. joke and, and that and, was and, the fail. and this and this is where abe moved me and i and i i'm deferring very much to abe because it, it didn't work the time didn't work but what he was saying is why should these survivors get all this press just because they lived well right. that was this put down right there you know from the from the shooting 
And then I realized the genius of that joke. And I think I was conflating, you'll forgive me. We now know you don't have to be a comic to masturbate to your friends. You could be a major news reporter on a major network. And uh, that was a piece of satire, by the way, in case anybody's looking for a dotted line. But uh, in reality, I think I was just still re responding to Abe finally laughed. Thank you, Abe. Um, uh, I think I was still responding to his embarrassment. But, and, and going over his oeuvre, I just said oeuvre on the air, Abe. <laughs> Um, going over his, oeuvre, <laughs> over his oeuvre, I think that he's brilliant. And, and Abe's, uh, Abe's hero is Chappelle, and I'm going to defer back to him. I think that man is really, really brilliant. And oh, if you want to know something about comedy, uh, watch Showtime and, and uh, the comedy club, five sections of it. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah, um, I, I think that uh, um, the, the way comedians, we had actually planned at the museum before um, uh, COVID hit, we were going to uh, um, do a program, which is how far is too far. Uh, um, yeah. And this was in response to a number of comedians who wrote pieces um, uh, saying, you know, come on, this is, we're going, we're going way off the deep end in censoring comedy. Uh, um, and, uh, um, and I, I don't, I, I don't know where I fall on this one because I do think that there are certain things where, um, uh, you know, you you hear it and you're like, no, that doesn't work. And you're not the person to say that. You're totally not the person to say that. So timing and and issues um, and, and the news, I think all are crucial in comedy. That's why it's an art. Um, it's not easy. Yeah, no, and, and, no. and to get back to the, the question that was posed about, you know, is it, is it the topic or is it the the comedian's relationship with politics or something? I actually think one of the most important aspects of this is the comedian's relationship with the audience. So mm -hmm. if Louis C.K. tells that joke four years early, and I don't think it's a brilliant joke, like I think he 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 screwed it up. You know, I, I think I think it was half half cooked, right? Um, so I don't want to defend that joke. But my point is just like I don't think that means we can't tell jokes about this sort of thing. Um, had he told that joke five years earlier, there's no way that reaction would have been the same, right? There's no way he would have gotten crap for that because he told way worse jokes on SNL, right? Um, and, 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 sorry. I said totally, no, no, I was no. just agreeing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, um, sorry, there's a bit of a delay, but, but, um, so, so the big thing that changed there was the audience. And by that, I mean, like the general American consumer of comedy had a different relationship to him where he wasn't, right. he, he didn't have the presumption of morality that sort of informed his, his humor before right. then. And so because of that, the joke lands differently. And, and, but right. here's the thing, people criticize this sort of thing as like being too woke or being like, like that's on Louis CK to know, right? That is still his fault. Like it is your job at, so um, last night, Chris Rock was on Jesus and Mero and he had this great line where he says, musicians play music to an audience comedians play the audience that's right, right? that's, that's their a great line isn't the it? audience yeah, yeah. It's, it's fantastic yeah. and there but that's the point right so if if you're a comedian you tell a joke that's like too offensive and nobody laughs and people are insulted by it you don't then get to complain about that right like right. that's on you to know your audience that's on you to know what the right. audience is thinking right. and how they're going to react so so and i this, tend to think on this debate everybody is everybody's wrong that's always my my right. take on everything let me quote a philosopher on this. Ted, Ted Cohn from the University of Chicago wrote a book on jokes, a philosopher, an epistemologist. Imagine epistemologist being funny. He said, we don't, want to, we don't want to recognize this often, but terrible, awful, miserable, destructive, racist, vulgar jokes are funny to the right audience because the three rules of comedy are audience, 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 as the three rules of real estate are location, location, location. So an absolutely pro-Nazi, anti-Jewish joke told to a pro-Nazi, anti-Jewish group is hysterical. The reality is, can you do that to a general group? And to back up Abe, 10 years ago, um, Clay was, uh, what's his whole name, Abe? I always get his name wrong. He was the dirtiest mouth on, uh, on comedy. He's not even close. Everyone talks that way now. Everyone uses language that would make my mother's hair curl a thousand times. You know, it's impossible. So we've changed, the audiences keep changing. And I think that's the reality of it all. So to say that that joke, even the joke I said, I hate, hate jokes that really hate people, 
there are haters who want to hear that joke. And, so I, um, I love the quote. I love, I, I want to add one thing in here from the book, which talks about oftentimes we need to address life from a skewered satirical point of view. So humor is the only thing that can sometimes reach people. Frederick Douglass famously said that when it came to abolishing slavery in the United States, quote, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Why? Because one can't reason with someone engaged in something so painfully unreasonable. So that, that I think is a, is a really good point that it almost says there isn't anything off limits if it's done right, if the timing on it is is delivered well, and 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 so I I do think that the I I think we forget how hard comedy is. Um, if you go to the yeah. National Comedy Center, um, which is a wonderful and glorious museum, inconveniently located about an hour and a half um, uh, away from <laughs> um, uh, but. In, a brilliant museum not only is it interactive but it is um it it's just it's it's also geared towards your sense of comedy you have to fill out um a number of different touch screens which of course I, i'm not sure what they're doing now um that talk about who you are you wear an armband and and the comedy um really moves towards your sensibilities as you go through the museum but the tour that i got from um a gentleman there who is just a, an amazing man um he said um, when they first started the museum, they did not want to deal in artifacts. They, but they had all these comedians who were donating artifacts. They were just going to do technology. And, um, um, and, they, and he said, we were dead wrong. The artifacts are things that people, these moments in comedy that, that people love, people stand in front of them in adoration. And he said, what do you think is the most visited site by comedians? And he said it was the briefcase that was owned by Rodney Dangerfield. Really? And isn't that amazing? So Rodney Dangerfield's brief, they all want to see Rodney Dangerfield's briefcase, which apparently was something that he carried with him all the time. It had all his jokes in it. And there yeah. he is in this case, and it's standing next to his suit, next to his suit. And in it, and this is the one that just mind was mind blowing for me, popping up out of it. And there's a whole other section of notes from Rodney Dangerfield about his um, jokes, but um, popping out of it is one thing. And what it says is, ladies and gentlemen, you're a wonderful audi audience. And then there's a parenthetical right next to it that says times two. And that blew my mind because you know, mm. when you, these comedians who just, you know, are so good at it and so natural that it flows straight from them. You forget how much work goes into this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The, uh, the comedian I had, that that's an amazing story. And, and like the times two is amazing. The person I had that with was Bernie Mac, um, who, who's one of my favorite yeah. comedians who I yeah, love. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I remember there was this time, so he, he has this whole bit that he used to do on, on uh, his nephew and niece wanting milk and cookies. And it, it's, if you've never seen it, I encourage you to look it up. It's, it's, it hasn't aged great. He uses some language that we wouldn't use today, but it's still really funny. Um, and, but I, w I fell down one of these YouTube rabbit holes where I was looking up him performing that in different venues. So, you know, seeing that joke being told in different ways. And the thing that was amazing was all of those things that I thought were just his idiosyncrasies and how he talked, you know, just, just his style. They were all exactly the same each time, right? And then I realized like, oh, this is completely rehearsed and this is down to the, it's that granular how this joke is laid out and what he's doing here. And you realize that like a lot of comedians who you just chalk up to like, oh, they're funny. It's like, no, 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 it's work. It's work. It's a no, lot it's a, of work and it's no, hard. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a performance art. And to go back to the, the Cliff Rock comment, that these maybe they're working on six or seven jokes, but then they integrate them as they go on to go to the comedy store. You see them slightly perform slightly in a different way. They're playing with the audience, but this is people who've got a repertoire. It's like an English professor being asked by a general class uh, um, on Shakespeare, and it, and is this a specialist that that they're prepared to do that? They know how to an they they know how to answer this. And I think comedy is about the presentation. It's about the persona. Abe and I love specific comics and love their material. And when, for example, that comic does something totally different, well, we kind of pulled back a little bit, you know? Uh, but comedy is the special art form. And, and stand-up comedy started in America. Maybe it was 
Mark Twain. I, I don't want to defend that proposition, but we created this art form. And out of that art form, although the Greeks started with satire, it was Sophocles making fun of Plato or Socrates at the time. It is uh, that comedy lives because of its satire, not just in telling funny one-liners. So I, I do want to, um, 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 I don't want to miss again, this huge chapter on um, on Jewish humor and 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 <laughs> how many Canadians, which again was eye opening to me. I thought I knew um, uh, um, all the Jews in comedy, and I was like, I did not know that at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, when when Al was talking before about like the neo Nazi audience and the Nazi comic who performs to them, I was like, yeah, but who's going to write his jokes? It's going to it's going to be Saul yeah. Goldblatt, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's our stuff. That's right, 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 right. But, uh, you know, the one thing, my dad got the book and he was like, you know, I love it, but I have to give you a hard time about something, which is you don't mention Groucho in the Jewish comedy oh, chapter yeah. at all. I know, which, I know. Which, you know, and I just realized before when you asked uh, what my fa who my favorite comedians were, you know, historically and presently, I didn't mention Groucho, even though Groucho, I think Duck Soup is probably the greatest piece of satire in American history. Um, and is, you know, one of my favorite, you know, Groucho and all the Marx Brothers are, I, I, I love dearly. Um, so I, I feel like we didn't mention him. Al, I, I'm curious if you think, if, if, I think I we didn't think to mention him. Be I think, I think it's just because he's, in, you know, the same reason why I don't mention like Cheerios or something like that. Like, it's just like, so part of my life that I didn't even think of him as like, something right. Up, and also but... because he, also because he wasn't a stand up and because for me, the heart and soul of the book, the heart and soul of satire is Mel Brooks. As Brooks said, I didn't do the producer. I, the producer was my last laugh at that goddamn Nazi. We beat him. He's dead. We're not. And so there's that edge to it, you know, and duck soup is just, the most abstract, absurdist kind of uh, satire. You're right, it's brilliant. And and we should beat ourselves and we'll do it in Latin, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. I'll explain that to you later, Abe, what that means. That was a bit of satire. Uh, no, it's, the, the reality, we should have done, we should have done that. Yeah. I used to sing Lydia the Tattooed Lady to the boys to, yes. um, uh, um, oh, yeah. to get them. Oh, to Lydia, complete. oh, Lydia. Yeah. <laughs> that encyclopedia. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are, Closing off in the hour here, um, uh, um, I want to I want to ask you, gentlemen, for any closing remarks on again this book. I love the title of it, "The Sanity of Satire," because it is really our ability to uh, um, to to make fun and to also make jokes that keeps us sane. Uh, um, um, surviving politics one joke at a time. What do you think yeah. the jokes are that we're going to be telling tomorrow? Oh. No, call us back for another show on that. But um, let me let me end my final remark with uh, with Mel Brooks again, who's not always thought of as a satirist, but he is. And I love this yeah. statement he did this years ago that for every ten people that God created, He made one comic. Otherwise, the rest of us would be lamenting so much that the world would never get any place. I think comics satirists keep us sane. I think without the pleasure and and the release of of humor and laughter. Uh, we would all be uh, beating ourselves to death in a cage. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Wayne? Yeah, maybe, maybe just a, as a last closing thought, um, I think one of the important aspects about political comedy and satire that often get overlooked is uh, not necessarily a comedian's ability to like push an agenda. So not necessarily Jon Stewart or Trevor Noah or or whoever. I think sometimes satire's greatest influence on our political lives is its ability to force us to take ourselves less seriously and take yeah. that which we affirm without thinking to question it right so sometimes i think some of the best and it's why i love duck soup is i don't know what the politics necessarily are behind duck soup i mean there you know there's speculation about all these things but i think it's fundamentally anarchistic right it's fundamentally just yeah. about you know, making fun of the presumptuous and making fun of people who think they know what's going on and making fun of ourselves because we believe we take these things that are not fully true and we believe them as if they were, you know, dogmas that couldn't be uh, couldn't be questioned. And I think that's actually the crucial role that satire and political comedy play um, for our lives and our and our society. So Ditto what he the, said. Ditto what he said. One of the images I loved in the was I believe it was uh, Justice Scalia, who was at one of the White House correspondence dinners, and um, uh, um, I'm not sure who was at the podium. I can't remember, but I I do know that um, everybody was being skewered, including him, and uh, um, 
And was this was this Colbert who said this? It was it was Colbert. He said Scalia was the yeah. only one laughing. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And I, I think that ability to be able to laugh at ourselves, even when we are being skewered, even when um, we feel it's our party being skewered or our candidate being skewered, that ability to step back and laugh at absurdity is a is a real gift that we um, we we sometimes lose a little touch from. Yeah. So absolutely. Um, I'm kind of hoping that uh, um, uh, um, after all of this is over, it's been a bruising battle, no matter which way it goes. I hope that we um, both sides have the ability to laugh at, uh, um, although I do know that the laughing is easier when you're victorious. So, uh, um, <laughs> so uh, um, I, I am, I'm, I hope that all of you have joined us tonight. First, I want to thank you gentlemen for a great book and a lovely conversation. It was just wonderful to talk to you. And then I want to thank all of you who joined us here and who will join us um, when you watch the show again. Please check this site. We're going to be talking about the election again, maybe this Thursday and again Tuesday on a happy half hour. And uh, we hope to see you here soon and we hope to see you as well. Thanks, Susie.